Hi, ladies. Oh, I'm so glad we're on Zoom today. How are you? got to be away from a crowd so yeah so i'm just getting set up over here this oh yeah right where you left it he's in custody looking at your life wasn't part of the plan but i'll take it they got what they deserve no thanks to you what do you think you deserve three years of my life back that's not good. i told you to stay in town man right? stay for charge so bad. You know why I'm here. You still have done the work. I figured out know, all that research that you did. You went really hit it. Here, have a Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Hi, everybody. You guys hear me? Just give me a uh, glory. Give me okay. Good. You guys good? Wow. What a big turnout. And I seriously walked in here and I'm like, what party am I? What, what party is happening? It really feels like a party. It's like fiesta. And I just want to give a shout out to the new people. Okay, you're already old news, Amy. <laughs> It's your second time, but we have, okay, Stephanie, you've been here before? Never been here before, so hello to Stephanie. And Stephanie also, Stephanie, Finn, no, that's, that's okay, hold on. I, okay, Stephanie, let me just like try to remember your last name. So Stephanie, I should know your last name. Bronstein and Finn, you're Finn, okay. Orson. Orsi. Okay. Stephanie Orsi. And Jody Finn. Okay. Are you related to to the Finns? Bruce. Okay. Okay. There's Dana right now. That's so funny. Dana, we're just talking about you. Because we have a Finn in the in the house. But she's a not related Finn. But yeah, hi. Okay, everybody. So welcome. So um, this is such a great turnout. It's so amazing. I keep on thinking like, oh, summertime. It's gonna like, you know, everyone's going on their ways. But I think because like everyone is going on their ways, like just schedules are changing. And it's nice to have, thank you. I actually yeah. really use a glass of water. Yeah. Thank you. So nice to have you back. What? And Hannah, and and any other any other new? I mean, you guys are it's like your second, third time. You guys, and and I'm so happy to see you back here. So nice. You're even here without Julie, right? So that's like hardcore. It's like, you know, she came with her daughter, Julie, but Julie couldn't make it. I don't need you. I'm on my own. I'm good. Okay, so I'll give you guys some uh, some like an update on my life <laughs> to get started. So um, do you, do you know that the world is in such a crazy place right now yes okay i try to stay away from the news but um every everything it's just there's so much chaos so i i sent off one of my children yesterday to camp um her flight was canceled um so we put her on another flight which was delayed she went standby lots of craziness she got to my parents house in toronto at 4 a.m last night no, Tehila, she's 12. Yeah, I'm like, no problem, you got this, you can do this. Um, yeah, it was, it was a crazy situation. So thank God she arrived, her luggage did not arrive. So the funniest thing was, I heard one of my kids, one of my little ones said, you know why the flights were all delayed and canceled and there's not enough pilots and it's all this, cause like we had this picture of the, you know, the luggage, it was, there were, no one's working, like they don't have enough staff. Is, this is Air Canada. I don't know if this is all everywhere, but in Canada, it's really bad. So one of my little kids said, it's like, it's really hard to get a flight nowadays because everyone's trying to get ab abortions. Yeah, like, you know, they think of things, like everyone is taking flights and trying to get abortions. So like, oh my gosh, okay. We, <laughs> we need to have like a family meeting. <laughs> like, this is not good. Yeah, one of my kids, a two shall be name, nameless right now. But it was really like I, you know, sometimes like you just feel like things are out of balance in the world, and and you know you interpret it as you do. But um, anyway, so she she made it to camp this morning without any of her belongings. So um, so like as I came into this class, I'm on the store. I, I'm on the phone with the store in Toronto. My sister's going to try to get her some basics and send it to camp and. Uh, she doesn't know like a soul. Oh, so she, so there was one girl on her flight from Chicago. So she's not friends with this girl. She probably met her on the flight for the first time, but the father decided to take, to take his daughter, like to get on the flight, like and fly her over because he was too nervous to let her go on her own, which was a really good thing. And, um, and while he was in the air, his wife had a baby. 
so he missed the birth like he literally just flew and came right back but anyways it was just like wow what an eventful night I, I got very little sleep last night it was like on the phone with my parents 3 a.m at the you know they're they're standing there at the uh Baruch Hashem, right everyone is well like it's just like keeping keeping up with all the the changes in the world and everything has a ripple effect like things that happen somewhere far away it, you know everything really impacts our life so which really brings me to last week's class when we spoke last week we were talking about mirrors so good to have you back so good to see you looking so well mirrors so we were talking about how everything in the physical world has a spiritual representation right and sometimes we can't understand what's going on and what is what is the parallel like if something's happening on a physical realm what does that mean in a spiritual world okay so i'm actually going to start by bringing back a lesson that we learned in israel like i'm like looking to this half of the room because a lot of the ladies here just returned from a trip and on the first night of the trip we spoke about how just like we don't like to be taken superficially right we want to really un explain ourselves and be understood properly so too judaism also doesn't want to be taken superficially and on the first night of the trip we we nearly are the speaker she gave a few examples of ways that when we read the torah when we're reading jewish literature we see that there are there's there's things that don't really make sense and she says that usually when you find something that's upsetting to you or just doesn't feel right, it's a crack in the code. It's like the matrix, right? The Torah is the, the, the handbook for Jewish living. And when something is a little bit off, we have to dig a little deeper. We can't just say, oh, it makes no sense. Let's throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Which very often we do. Because I mean, personally, I, I've been in this Jewish journey for decades of my life and not everything makes sense to me. But it doesn't mean I'm giving up on it. It just means I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand it a little bit more. Like someone last week or two weeks ago brought up the question, I'm not sure it's one of you, Lori, or maybe, maybe Lori, about where was God during the Holocaust? Like, and there is, I don't have an answer. I've been asking that question for decades of my life. Maybe we tried to give some perspective and I think it was a good conversation. I don't think I'll ever have an answer that I could that I could give. I don't, I don't know if any human being could ever give an answer to that. If someone did, I would probably not respect that person. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept their answer, right? You know what I mean? Like there is no answer. So, Kana? I was just gonna say that I've questioned that too. And say it's not to always God, it's to always people. Ah, yeah, where was man? Yeah, I love, they yeah I've heard that before. Especially yeah. here, people yeah. know. It's still, it's very complex, but oh, I hear yeah. that and you're right, but also where is God? Like we're, like a lot of this course is we're trying to emulate God's good traits. What about, what about the harsh parts of God? Like there's judgment, there's, there's harshness. Also, we can't sweep it under the rug. So I'm going to give some examples that we spoke about, and this will be um, jogging your memory going back six weeks. I know we were all like a little haze that first night. We were like, is it, is it time for bed yet? Yeah. But some of the examples, and maybe you'll remember, I just jot it down. So, okay, so this is like cracking the matrix, okay? And we're gonna start with this and then we're gonna go into our chapter. So, and these are some examples that we have spoken about many times. So for my seasoned class, people that come to my Parsha class on Saturday, like Adrian, you've heard me say these time and time again, when we actually read the Torah and we find the words, I'm always jumping on these things. So for example, it says in the Torah, and he camped right? Which doesn't make sense. It's talking about the whole nation of Israel camping around Mount Sinai. Why is it says, and he camps, right? Does anyone remember? Because I've, I've spoken about this a dozen times. What's the crack in the matrix over there? It's supposed to say, and they camped. But he and our commentary say it's singular because the Jewish people, all 6 million of us, six, 600,000 of us souls at that time were considered like one. Right. Okay. So that was that crack in the matrix. The he meant the unity. We were so one in body and spirit. Okay. Another example in the Torah, it says, um, build me a sanctuary and I will dwell in you. What's that supposed to mean? Like a sanctuary is like a thing, 
And God is saying, I'm going to dwell in you. And that is the crack. What's the crack in the matrix? If anyone remembers that lesson. Going to take a guess. Who's the you? It's the us, right? Meaning that we don't have a holy temple anymore. We don't have a tabernacle. We don't have the way things were before we went into this very long exile. But as we went in, God knew. He knew what was going to happen. And he said, don't you worry. In your heart will be your own inner sanctuary. You got this. You might not have my temple in your midst, but you are a walking sanctuary of God. I will dwell within you. And God dwells within every home. Every home, every Jewish home is called a mikdash ma'at, a mini sanctuary. And so the home is definitely the place of Judaism, but, but we have to take it a little deeper. Like it's within you. It's within every soul, every Jewish soul. Hannah is like jumping out of her I'll seat over here. I'm jumping because this is really <laughs> exciting. And I built these ladies into my shoe. And over the Arona Kodesh, we have that oh, Which one? The one you just said, we should dwell. I don't remember. Can you? Oh, we have the quote. Right. That you In Arizona? We should dwell. I don't, you know what I'm talking about. Look into my shoe. Arizona. And we have that quote. Right. Yes. So very famous. Right. It's a good reminder. Oh yeah. My yeah. Okay, good. So those are two, two examples. Now, the example that we used on the trip, which brings us back to like who we are as Jewish women. So the first time we see an idea in the Torah is, is a very clear indication of what that thing is. So when we, we always go to the beginning of the Torah, when we see something for the first time, we understand what the essence is. So we ask the question, well, wh when's the first time we see the first woman, right? And we could all, we all know when that's, who was the first woman? Eve. So we go to the book of Genesis and it's so interesting, the language that is used around woman. It's God says, let me build you a woman because by then he built woman from Adam's rib. First, there was just man. And then Adam said, I need, I need a wife. I need a partner. So he built by even that's how you shot, like he built the woman, right? And it says, I will make you an Azer Kenegdo. Azer means a helper. Kenegdo to oppose you. Okay, it's like very interesting. This is complete code. Like, how do you guys feel about being a helper? Right, so I remember like Neely said on the trip, she's like, Gloria Steinham would have a heart attack right here, right? Mm -hmm. she, like, we don't, who wants to be a helper, right? So, but just like, we don't like being taken superficially, we have to dig a little deeper. What is a helper? So lots of scenarios, lots of ideas, lots of examples that, that we spoke about. Um, a doctor and a patient, who's helping who? Doctor. Is helping the patient, right? What? Employed, but I mean, when you're going to seek help, a doctor, a nurse, who's helping who? Right? A teacher and a student, who's helping who? Of course, there's always both, but when you go to seek, you want to go to a specialist, right? You want to learn a language. You need to go to someone that has more information than you do. Of course, there's both. We're all helping each other. We're all part of this fabric of the world, right? But there's usually, someone is usually superior in some way that could give help or advice to someone that doesn't have that understanding. A doctor might be the helper in that, in a situation with a patient, doesn't mean he's a great person. Doesn't mean he's a good parent, right? But as a doctor, he is superior. Okay, so the whole understanding of this word azer, this help, this helper, really shows superiority. Then you take it one step further. The word azer, we have an Israeli here, Hannah. What does azer mean? Azer. Azer. Ayin Zion Resh. La Azor. Oh, to help. To help. Okay, oh, that's oh, the I literal see. word. But there's the root, the shoresh of the word. Azer or la azor to help. What's the root? 
Ayin Zayin. Ayin Zayin. Go, go, take it, narrow it down. What's Uz? What does Uz mean? Ayin Zayin. Strength or power, right? So interesting. So so we're, we're basically, once we start digging, wait, first we think, what, what is this? The Torah is saying, I'm going to help them. Like a coffee table could, could hold something. Like we don't need, we, we're not going to stand around trying to help. Like we are so much more than that, right? But when we dig a little deeper, so now we're saying strength. Um, you know how we describe God in the Shemona Esrei, in the private um, prayer, the Amida? We say, Hashem, Melech Ozer. We use that same word. Ozer is the word that describes God, that God is the king that helps. And that's the same word that, that God calls the, the women. Okay, so you see how like when you start digging, it's things unfold. Um, if you guys remember, I mean, is this triggering your memory? Do you guys remember any of this stuff? Totally not. Totally not. It's like, we can say anything on this trip and you guys will be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. I seriously, I was like scared to, to, to review so early, but you guys are great. Okay, so I'll take it one step deeper. Okay, one step deeper. This maybe will jog your memory a little bit. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Okay. And here you have this woman that was called an Azer. Here, Adam, here is your helper, right? And, and at first we feel like a little bit shocked at that term, at that word. Think about what were they doing in the Garden of Eden? What were they wearing? Nothing. Nothing. What does that mean? No laundry. <laughs> what were they, what, where did they live? In the garden. No housekeeping. What did they eat? Fruit. Organic fruit. Organic fruit, right? It's just like you yeah. can eat all from, from all the, the trees, of, right? except for one, which of course they messed up on, okay? Fruit, no dishes, no cooking, no shopping. What did they do? Did they have to work? No, it was only after they sinned that they were cursed with Adam Amal Yulad, that man is meant to toil and work really hard. They, had, they were just living in the lap of luxury. Everything was taken care of them. So what does it mean? So how can we superficially say, God wants women to be a helper? Like she wasn't like helping him like domestically. They didn't have any children. What was she doing all day? So when we dig deep, we realize that women's help is actually spiritual. We see things in a completely, our world, our frame of mind is physical because that's our life. But their existence was completely spiritual and women's connection to God was so much stronger that women was created to help Adam spiritually. He couldn't get to where she, she was just by being, right? Because what do we know about women? Woman was, was created with what? Something special and something so, different. So Sorry? So well, every person was, was created in the image of God. Every human being has divine, a divine spark of God within them. Jews, non-Jews, everyone, okay? So that's Salem Elohim, the image of God. That's everybody. But it says about woman, right? So, so yeah, so that's what we spoke about two weeks ago when we spoke about compassion. The root of compassion, rachamim, is oh. rechem, right? The womb, right? So there is the separate compassion, this extra empathy that a woman has. But... Think about how God built woman from Adam's rib, right? The word vayi ben, and he built. That root is bina. Anyone know what that word is? Bina is intuition. That God says woman was built with an extra dose of intuition. She has an understanding that man will never have. Isn't this amazing stuff? Like, why don't they teach us this in Sunday school? It's so beautiful. So women, I know it's like I'm preaching to the choir. Okay, okay. So we could we could carry on in that, but now we're gonna we're gonna just take that shelf it a little bit and let's open our chapter. Okay. So this was yes. Question: Adam and Eve didn't have children. Well, eventually they did. Yeah, but in the beginning, when God built women. And he said, here's your helper. 
they were living in the lap of luxury. Like all they had to do was not blow it. And they blew it. Well, eventually they did. There's 10, yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm saying after they sinned, I mean, everything changed. Yeah, do, do you know who their children were? Oh my God, Right, Cain and Abel. So one killed the other. I mean, we have lots of history. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually, so there's, yeah, of course. And you can actually see the whole lineage. Um, new and exciting, I'll just take a commercial break for a second to jump on this because we could all brush up on our, on our uh, history. So I, I met a fabulous woman yesterday who's a, a Jewish history teacher. She's so incredible. And I asked her if she would give a course here. So she's going to start. I have to tell Julie about this. And yeah, no, I'm just letting you know. It's like, I'm really, really excited. She has decades and decades of, um, of experience teaching Jewish history. Well, not really. I think she's a really excellent teacher. But yeah, it's been a long, it's been a long history. Um, her name is Pincus. Her last name is Pincus. And yeah, well, if you guys remember, we had the, we had her son here for Shabbos a few, like a month or two ago, Shani, and I think his name was Josh Pincus. Do you remember the night he spoke on Shabbos and they have seven boys like the, do you remember? They brought a bunch of them. So, so the, he, she's the, the mother. She actually, she herself, I think, I don't know, she's just, just a, they have a big family. Yeah. Anyways, wonderful, wonderful teacher. And I think that's, that's something that we haven't really studied so much over here. So, so stay tuned. We're gonna, we're gonna start that hopefully in the summer with the history of the, the downfall of the temple, because that's very timely for this time of year, because we're actually going. So the, so she'll, she'll take us through the history of, of us kind of leaving Israel and going into the exile that we're in. And then we said, we said we're going to start with that because it's timely for this time of year, because in, in a couple of weeks we have, you know, the very sad time of year, Tisha B'Av. So we'll, we'll learn about that. And then we're going to go back and start from the beginning. She's going to start from Adam and Eve. She's going to take us through like all of history. So, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, no silly questions. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. No, that's, that's beautiful. I love that. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's like, I'm so, well, well, just that's, that's another beautiful, that's a very beautiful physical to spiritual parallel. Like we light our candles with the shamish and that shamish is, is it represents someone lighting up other souls. So no, shamash means to, what, what, how do you, a helper. Is it a helper? Yeah. Like shamash means, I think, to like show, like, like. I think it's like. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what the technical term is. It just like the shamash is a the person in shul. Like Brad Miller is our shamash. He comes early. He sets everything up. He makes sure there's always coffee. Like he's like the one to like show us and like to like matron. set things up. Like just to like make sure everything is like. And that's such an important person because like nothing functions without someone. To, you know, unlocking the door and, you know, waking up my husband when he oversleeps and <laughs> stuff like that. Like, seriously, you're like, Brad Miller has like a big portion in the world to come for sure. Okay. So yeah, so but that's a great, great, that's, that's another way of describing the Jewish woman that we, we are like that shamish. I mean, every person could be a shamish. Every person could like, cause think about a candle. When you light a candle, the flame that you light it from never diminishes. So we believe that we are supposed to light up the hearts and souls of everyone around us. And, and the more you give, the more you inspire others, you are inspired. You are on fire with this. You're never, it never depletes you, right? Contrast to the book, The Giving Tree that we all grew up with, where the more you give, the less you are. You will be a tree stump, a tree stump with no fruit, right? That's a very that's a very anti-Jewish perspective. We believe the more you give givers are happy people, right? We believe give and give and give and give till it hurts. It will, you'll get it all back. It'll come back. It's like God sees everything. Give, 
So that's that's the shamish, like that's the Jewish mother. The, the Jewish mother, the woman, is compared to a shamish. That is that her task is to light up all the souls around her. So I love that. Thank you, Julie. That's a beautiful way of having a physical and a spiritual parallel. And we need to start thinking about how we could how we could find more parallels in our life. Because I, I honestly think everything has a parallel. It, this is not just me. This is like Jewish wisdom says this world is by the way this world is just the, the the hallway this is what our sages tell us to the next world this is just a mini experience of what is to come it's, it's this is not the real deal there's something so much better and greater and and more beautiful that's that awaits us right with all the chaos and and you know that that we're experiencing today yeah Yes, so true. Own it. Okay, so this week's chapter, we're going to tie this in now. Okay, so last week we spoke about what was last week? We spoke about about order, right? Do you remember? Yeah. Right? Okay. I'll, I'll tell you the last couple of weeks. What? Okay. I'll, I mean, the last few weeks we did humility, patience, gratitude, compassion. And last week we spoke about order. Okay. Seder. Okay. Now we're going to speak about a, another great an interesting one, equanimity, okay? In Hebrew, we say menuchat hanefesh, which is like peace of the soul. So just like with everything, we always have debate. We always have debate. Like you'll hear one rabbi saying, this is the most important character trait to build and to work on. And you'll have someone else saying, absolutely not. So my question for us to think about over the next half hour is where does this trait fit in? Is it our goal to get to a place where we rise above all the good and the bad and we have this amazing place of calmness and tranquility? Is that our goal as evolved human beings? Who wants to be completely tranquil and calm? I mean, after the night I had last night, like with, could you imagine? And my daughter's cell phone that we just got her did not work. My, my father says, my, my father is so frustrated because he's trying to get through and it's three in the morning and he's waiting at the air, at, you know, at, in the terminal. And um, my father's like, what did you do? Sign her up for, for like a phone that like calls, like makes calls only to Tibet. You know, like it was like, you know, and it, it was good to laugh a little bit, but we were like so frustrated with the whole situation and totally in chaos. So it's interesting that we're going to talk about finding peace within the chaos. So think of an EKG, right? Wait, Eve, I have a question. There's not in person, right? In the hospital with someone that you love, you've watched it on TV, right? So we know that when there's lines, it's a good thing. When there's no lines, it's really not a good thing. right? Okay, so that's kind of how we're gonna talk about this chapter because it's impossible to get through life with no interference, no static, no chaos. That is not the goal. The goal is not just to go through life. The goal is to grow through life, not to go through life. Now, think about this. When you watch a movie, you wanna see the action-packed movie where there's loss, and failure and risks and all types of craziness, right? Because that is, that makes for a good movie, right? When your heart is really beating, you want to watch that movie. But interesting, you don't want to live that life. We want to watch someone else struggle and fail and get back up a million times again. 
but we want our life to be so nice and peaceful with no interference. So hypocritical of us. We want to see someone else struggle. We get a kick out of that, but we want to have it nice and cool. So what's going on? Yes, Adrian. Mm. You know, how can you tell what things are good? If it things are always good, yes. right? Okay, like that. So, so you kind of, to appreciate things, you need to be in a dark place sometimes, okay? It doesn't have to be so dark. Doesn't, yeah. Okay. So it's really interesting. Our sages tell us that we should pray for small, annoying things to happen to us in our life. We call it yasurin, like small troubles rather than a big trouble. So we actually ask for troubles. Because we know that none of us are gonna have that, that you know, smooth path ahead. So we'd rather things that we could handle. And one way of praying for challenges, because like who wants to pray for challenges is to say, please God, be gentle with me. Give me something that I could handle, something that I could swallow. Let it be with grace, let it be with, just be gentle with me, right? I can get through stuff We're we're not, we're not gonna dissolve. We're not gonna melt. We're made of strong stuff. We can handle things, but let it not be so harsh. Susie. Right. Um, yeah. so it's kind of like building like muscle <laughs> but we don't ever want to we don't ever want hardships right we don't ask for hardships but we know that it's inevitable that we're going to have something so building that that muscle we call it muscle memory in a way so that when something happens you're not thrown on your feet you you have the resilience kapara last year yes okay we're almost there again you know i've almost been here a year isn't that crazy so yeah like yeah last year when 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 i started teaching here in i don't know july august so we went through elo together right the month of elo right before the high holidays is when we talk about atonement about teshuva repentance all these things before our high holidays so i introduced the concept of kapara means an atonement and this is a very sephardic thing i'm my, i married a sephardi so everything bad that happens ah kapara kapara like that's just how we we you know everything bad it should be a kapara it should be an atonement rather that than anything else. Like last night, honestly, like 3 a.m. And I'm waking and my husband's fast asleep. And I'm like, Gaddy, she doesn't have her luggage and I can't get through to her and wake up. And, 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 and you know, so what does he say as Kapara? I'm like, oh, so frustrating. You know, like, did you not hear a word I said? Our 12 year old is in an airport across, in a different country alone and her phone doesn't work and I'm going to strangle you right now, right? And he's like, Kapara. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's interesting, like we can see it for small things because, you know, everything is okay, but sometimes things are not okay. And honestly, it's, it, it could be very hard to say, it was a kapara. Going back, Lori, to our, our very difficult conversation about the Holocaust, a lot of a lot of a lot of great minds have spoken about this idea of of this massive atonement for the Jewish world. That this was a a, a sacrifice on a huge level for for the Jewish world. Like like a big portion of our people were wiped out. But you know, just like in Egypt, in Egypt, I think one fifth of the Jews didn't make it out of Egypt. It was a massive kapara, but the rest, but some did make it out. And, and we were able to rebuild again. We don't understand, but it could be on a small level, like so small that our sages actually say that when you put your hands into your pocket, looking for, you know, a dollar bill and you get something different, 
that's a small kapara. Like it goes so small, like that small annoyance of like, oh, I got the wrong change that I was, I wasn't looking for that, I, right? All the way to, to, to things we can't even imagine that that concept of atonement is, it, that's, it's a huge concept. Yeah. I was gonna say oh, that. Okay. You know, but I guess I wanna get started in this chapter because uh, we don't you know, have so much time. Of the daughter, you know, yeah. isn't that true that once a child before they come down back next week, they're all gone. Oh, clearly she was on her own last night. <laughs> but you know, Baba Yadin Steinson, which may he rest in peace, you know, he was my rabbi's mentor. He always used to say when there's a problem, there was a problem, and now what? Mm. Mm. And now what? So, so I like what you're saying, and this is actually, can I just talk about this for a second, and then let's move on. But mm. Susie, I want to hear what you have to say also. Okay, so, so the word lama. Anyone know what does that word mean? Why? Why lama? Like if you're going to Israel, you're gonna like say like like I don't know. You might use that word, right? Mm -hmm. Lama. So so, Rebbetzin Esther Jungreich, she says the same word with different vowels, different different. It's a, a totally different meaning. Lama is like why, which is what we ask ourselves all the time. Like why this? Why that? Why it's craziness, right? Lama could also be pronounced lima. Same letters, different vowels. That means to what end? Mm -hmm. For what purpose is this? It takes the why, which, which sometimes we have no answers, to what can I do with this? What does what does what is God asking of me now? What how am I supposed to step up to this challenge? That same word can be changed. I, thank you for yeah. bringing that. Yeah. yeah. Now what? Like like, well, I always think about it because when I Susie, have a challenge, I always say. Susie, let's, let's just. That's what they say, and that's not, and that's, and that's not the right thing to tell someone that's that's struggling, right? Never tell that to someone that's struggling, by the way, because they'll be like. Let, let's get let's go a little bit into this because because this topic might maybe we all Lori you and I all of us we need a little bit of inner peace okay because we're we're so much in conflict with all the things that we hold so let's try to dig into this so very I'm going to start with once again there's there's different opinions over here the greatest mind in the Musser world Rav Yisrael Salanter he says his words are this as long as one lives a life of calmness and tranquility in the service of God, I mean, that sounds really good to you, right? That doesn't sound so ideal. No, he says it is clear that he is remote from true service. He is saying that we never want to get to a place of complete tranquility and peace. We, you and I, Lori, daughters and granddaughters of survivors are going for the rest of our, it's in our genes. We pass this on to our kids. That, that question, that struggle, and that's okay. We're never supposed to mute ourselves and we're never supposed to not feel the pain that we feel. So, and this is what, what Rabbi Yisrael Salanter is saying. He says, if you would come to a place of complete peace, I mean, you might as well be an angel. Go up, live on a, a hilltop, be a monk. That's not what God wants of us. We are human beings. So comfort is not a virtue in our world. We are not looking for comfort for, for right? Comfort invites us to snuggle up and to fall asleep. And that is not what we're after. That can't be our spiritual goal, right? We, okay, so have you guys ever heard the song, the whole entire world is a very narrow bridge? Yeah, so it's Rabbi Nachman from Breslov. He, mm. he wrote this beautiful piece and they put it to music and it's Kol Ha'ulam Kulo Gesher Tsar Ma'od. You, you know it from camp, Ellen, I'm looking at you. Ve'ha'ikar, ve'ha'ikar, lo No, no one knows it here. It has hand motions. The whole entire world, it's a very narrow bridge, a very narrow bridge, yeah. 
Okay, and okay, and then the words go on. And the main thing is to be calm and to have no fear at all. Okay, that's Rabbi Nachman Mibreslu. He was all about happiness and finding peace and tranquility. We have Rabbi Salanter who's saying, don't do it, don't do it. Don't find peace and tranquility completely. And then Rabbi Nachman is saying, we need to find that inner peace. Okay, and as I said last week, we're always looking for the middle path. We're always, we're always, we always want balanced. We don't want to go to any extreme. Okay. We want to feel when we go all the way to peace, we are literally not feeling anything. We're not feeling any joy because we don't want to feel any pain. We're completely numb. And that is not how we want to live. So this narrow bridge, okay, this, that is, okay, a ladder or a bridge is a physical representation to a spiritual idea that we are all passing through this world on this narrow bridge and it's rickety and it's shaky and it's chaotic. And we're like, how am I gonna make it across the bridge? That is our life, right? It's a great parable to us whenever we're going through a hard time, we're walking through a narrow street. How am I gonna get through? How am I gonna get across? And Rabbi Nachman says, just have no fear. Find your inner peace, dig deep, okay? So, so you see that there's like these different ideas over here. And what Rabbi Salanter, that original from the 1800s, that, that genius of this movement, the Muslim movement, he's saying, rather find truth. He's looking for truth. He says, don't find peace and tranquility, find truth. Stick with that. Stick with what, what, what your soul is speaking to you about. We're not supposed to erase that. We're not supposed to quieten any part of us. He says, find truth. Let the struggle continue within you. So he talks about the inner forces that are always pulling us, always getting us off track. So what are those inner forces? The Yitzhar Hara, our evil inclination, it's always pulling us off, right? There's a great story here. Um, this rabbi, rabbi, this is pretty, uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know, 70, 80 years ago, Rabbi Elia Lopian from England. Have you ever heard of him? So he was a great teacher from the last generation, and he was working with boys in a yeshiva. And one student asked him, he wanted to go to a family uh, get together, and he came from a family that, that was very different to the way he was training himself now in the yeshiva world. So the rabbi said, I don't know if it's going to be so good for you yet to go back home. There's going to be all types of promiscuity. Who knows what, what the situation was? This is in Europe a long time ago. So Rabbi Lopian says, you know, maybe you're not so ready to throw yourself back into that environment. You have to be strong first. So the boy, this yeshiva buffer, probably a teenager, said, don't worry, Rabbi Lopian, I have it all planned out. I am going to close my eyes when things are inappropriate. I'm going to just not, I'm going to look the other way. I'm just not going to involve myself in any of the promiscuity that's going to be happening. So Rabbi Lopian, he's 92 years old. I love that this that this story was printed because it just shows the realness. Like we don't make people out to be like these holy sages. Like this is so real. Rabbi Lopian, this great sage, he says, I'm 92 years old. I'm half blind. And if someone promiscuous would walk in front of me, I would look. I just loved it. I love that that's printed here because they don't make him out to be like this giant. He's human. He has a yet, we all have an evil inclination. We all have forces within us that if we could be so pious, but then we could, we're put into the situation again and we fall, right? That's life and that's okay. Such is human nature. So Musser doesn't point us towards being, to, towards like complete transcendence, okay? Musser is pointing us to truth to being real. So, okay, let's see how much, we have 10 more minutes. Um, there was a lot here that, I, that, that reminds me if anyone here has had the pleasure of giving birth to a child, okay? We know that there is, it's not such a, actually such a fun thing to do, right? Oh, at, at, in the moment, right? Moment, in the moment, right? So, <laughs> So, but when, when a woman is going through the, la the final stages of labor, right, we call it transition, that's when 
I mean, I remember I was like, I want to go home. I'm like ripping every like, wire out of me. I'm like, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And they're like, you're going to, you're about, you're ready to push the baby out. And I'm like, I am so done. Right. Cause you're so, you just don't want to do it anymore. But the best way of really bringing this baby on and this birth to the end so that you could finally hold the baby in your arms is by embracing the challenges embracing the contractions mm -hmm. instead of fighting every contraction you, you need to let it kind of come over you like a wave right like let you there's no way around it you have to go through it right so so too our our Musa sages are saying over here that a calm soul is like a surfer who rides the wave Regardless of what is happening within and around right, the craft direction that he chooses, okay, he is in control somewhat within his circumstance. So equanimity that we're kind of looking for that right balance is the quality of being centered in yourself. It's being centered through the through though at the same time being exquisitely sensitive to all the forces that are at work around you. So keeping that Yetzir Hara, that evil inclination at the door, kind of noticing that you are human, that you are not invincible, you are not, you're not perfect. You could fall at any given moment, right? But keeping that balance, that centeredness in who you are, that's where the work is. It's not trying to eradicate. It's trying to work with all the forces, but strengthen your core, like, like a surfer. You're doing what you can. You see the forces around you. You don't know if you're gonna fall off. You don't know if you're gonna get to, to shore. You don't know, but all you could do is stay centered. So that's what we need to do, okay? It's not numbing. It's not, it's not throwing things away. It's taking the ups and downs, trying to stay awake in the experience in the pain also, in the disturbing places, right? So self-awareness, right? We don't want to not, we want to be aware of everything that's happening and, and consciousness, right? We, we, that's, that's how we're going to walk through these tests. It doesn't matter if you pass or fail a test, but it's all tests. Everything is a test. Great story that just happened to a friend of mine in Israel. <laughs> Um, one of my colleagues from one of the schools that I taught in uh, like two decades ago, Rabbi Nissel, he, um, he's living in Jerusalem and he's going, I think he was driving to the pharmacy and he opens his car door and someone else that parked right next to him also opened their door at the same time and their doors kind of crashed and the, the car was damaged. So Rabbi Nissel, it's like a hot Jerusalem day. He has places to go. He's a very busy person. Like he gets out of the car, like ready to be upset. And the guy gets out also, he's also presumably gonna be upset, right? Both of them were, had damaged cars. And he says, OFG. And Rabbi Nissel's like, excuse me, uh, what does that mean? Like, you know, we know all the things from our teens, like LOL, like, you know, AKA, you know, we know lots of short terms, but he's like, what the heck is OFG? And the guy says, opportunity for growth wow. amazing and it totally totally like put all their tension at bay like okay it was unfortunate i'll just give you here's my insurance give me yours we'll fix this okay everything is okay right opportunity for growth so life is full of tests and these tests are all custom designed for our growth right um the best time to practice like working on our patience, on our strength, on our, you know, the best time to really try something out is when you're not in the moment of heat. Like, for example, if you want to try a parenting skill, don't do it when you're really mad at your kid and, and your, you know, your kid just did something, got kicked out of school. Like, don't do it then. Try to talk to your kid when things are calm and you love them and you're not angry. And that's the best time to strengthen the muscle. So same over here, right? 
So this is, I'm just going to read you from the altar of Navarda, which is also like hundreds of years ago. He says, his view is, we all tend to be very pious and God-fearing so long as there's nothing particularly difficult and challenging. There's nothing that's really opposing our willpower at the moment. It's easy to be pious when you're, when everything is going well. He says, he warns that when those sort of troublesome challenges do come our way, as they eventually will, we are lucky to, we are likely to find ourselves unprepared and at risk of crumbling. So the, the point is to find that balance before you're challenged to find that balance. Because usually in the storm, you're not gonna be the best surfer because you didn't practice when the waters were calm, right? This is like nipping it in the bud is doing good and being together as one people in good times, right? When we speak a lot, I speak a lot about unity. Right? It's like my favorite topic. And the Jewish people were known to, we're such a beautiful people, but we're so fractured. And it's so unfortunate that the only times we come together is when things are bad. When things are bad, we're all one, right? The way it's supposed to be. But when things are good, uh, she's this, that, whatever. Uh, she goes to that synagogue. And it's just ridiculous. We fracture ourselves and we only come together during hard times. So what their sieges are telling us here is don't do that. When things are good, practice finding that balance, that peace. How do we find balance? Okay, let's, let's finish this class. Let's bring this into practicality. How can we do this? How can we do it? We can't leave ourselves, right? We, this is, you, you go through life with yourself as a person, right? I mean, one of my friends, Ariella Malofsky, I don't know if you remember Ariella, she used to run Momentum, like she was the partnership. Um, so she, she's a good friend of mine from Denver. And when we met, left Denver 11 years ago, we moved to Portland and she said to me something so wise. She said, you don't forget when you move, you take yourself with you. I, I feel like I was kind of running away from, from certain things. She's like, you're gonna take yourself with you. You still have your stuff to work out. Okay, so, so how can we do this? Does anyone here meditate? I do not. And any, no one here meditates, Hana, a little bit? Okay, both Hanas, okay? So, so, so tell me about the experience of finding that inner well, core. I have gone through a lot of things in my life that are very, very different. And what I do when I meditate is I put music on and then I, I just have a thing that I say, like I say, thank you, God. Oh, please help me, God. I always use the word God in it. And then I do it, you know, I lay down. So just like finding your breath, finding, okay, yeah, okay, centeredness. I follow also not that the one. You know, he has the thing where you, oh, and you, you breathe, let's see, seven in, then you hold it for four minutes. Okay. And then eight minutes out. Four minutes. I mean, I'm seven. <laughs> <laughs> I love Regina's like. I want to talk she's, about it. Talk about it. Uh, I wanted to see if she's paying attention. Okay. It's very cute. So you do. That's very cute. Eight, four, seven. If, if this works for you, try it. If it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me at all. I, I don't meditate. I, I don't find any peace in well, it. You know, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. Sorry. Prayer is meditation. You're right. Yeah. Right. Now, but but even that, to be honest. It's so hard for me to quiet my mind, but Marilyn. You know prayer is, is one of the things that I struggle with the most. I'm just being honest. Like I, I do pray, but I have it's so hard to, to quiet in the mind. Mm, I love that. I love that. Love that. Yeah. No, I talk to God all the time, but it's usually in frustration. It's like, so you know, I'm running late. God help me. <laughs> okay, wait. So I want to. I want to. It's very, very hard to get into meditation. It took me a very, very long time. Was to do it for five minutes, and but I, I think in the long run, people that are like constantly. Place, I think it's a great thing to do. Totally. Meditation is being in the present moment. Yes. 
Time is a present moment. Right. And I'm thinking about the past or the future. This. I know. I'm Love that. Thinking. Love that. Right. That's the so, so, okay. So, so here's a few things, and we're going to close up in a, in a minute or two. In relationships, okay, it's very, it's very common that if something doesn't work out in a relationship, unfortunately, some people might throw the relationship away. Okay. Then you get back into a relationship. And what do you, what are you faced with? It's the same, the same problems. It, it might not have been the guy. <laughs> like it, it might actually be you. And we play out the pattern again and again and again. Okay. Something that I once heard in regard to parenting was your children are not in the way. They are the way. If we could bring that into our lives, our challenges are our way. This is our customized personal obstacle course, so to speak, to get us to where we need to get through, to, to grow through our life, right? It's not, it's not supposed to be smooth, okay? So it's interesting that in many relationships, we usually find ourselves right back where we started because we're not doing our homework, right? It's not necessarily that person. It's you. One of my favorite parenting stories is of this guy that is, he's walking around the supermarket with his two-year-old who's tantruming in the front of the, of the you know, carriage, the cart, and the two-year-old is throwing things out of the cart and screaming and biting his father, and he's just done. Like, he's overdue for his nap. And the father is so calm and so patient. And we're almost there. We have two more things to get on our list. Oh, look, we're checking out. We're, we're going to be home in no time. It's going to be nap time. So calm, so patient. He gets to the cash. He's putting everything on the conveyor belts. He's paying out. And this lady that's right in front of him, she says, I have to say, you are so patient. What a good father. I just, I can't get over how you're speaking so lovingly to your son like this. And he said, I'm not talking to my son. I'm talking to myself, which is so perfect. It's so perfect. That is basically it. Like, it's not about everyone else. It's about ourselves and getting through the hardship. This is our challenge. The people are not in our way. They're part of our way, right? Isn't that the best parenting story? Like, remember that one next time, Tana. Okay. <laughs> I know, seriously. No, but then your kids are like, hey, my mother talked to herself. <laughs> but it's okay. They say crazy things about us anyway, so it's all good. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so very good. So each one is bringing out Heath Badadut, what Sunny Levy spoke about. So Heath Badadut is a form of meditation. It's a Jewish ancient form of meditation where you go off into the forest or by yourself anywhere, just quietly. Like forest is the typical place. And you just talk to God. You just cry out and, and just, that's heat's what it does. It's a form of meditation. And actually there was a chapter like way in the beginning of the book where it spoke about different ways of, come, of, of really getting into all these all this work, this character building. And it, that's one of the avenues. That's one of the pathways. There are many pathways to fixing yourself. So one of them is introspection, meditation, he's about to do just talking to God, like being quiet, stilling the mind. It's so hard when it's, it's so, I mean, it was always hard for me, but now with this thing that lives in my hands, in my life, always dinging and buzzing and chiming. And I mean, I can't even keep up, right? It's so intense how much is coming at us. It's so much harder to calm down and to center. It's all about centering. Okay, so that is one way. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close here. Um, I'm going to close and there's so much more to say, but I really, I really wish if you guys want to get this, this book and read all. Um, okay. Okay, this the book is called Everyday Holiness. Alan Marinus, he is a contemporary, yeah, I'd love to have him come, a contemporary author on, he's, um, he has the Musser Institute. I'm not sure. Does he live in, in LA? Do you know if he lives in LA? I don't know where he lives now. I'm not sure where he but lives. He used, he used to come here. I mean, he has his doctorate from Oxford. Um, he's a pretty impressive person. He's been studying Musser since 97. 
And um, so he founded the Musser Institute. You can look it up online. Um, and so basically he just, he creates groups of study of Musar. And just because you guys kind of came in late, we've been doing this all year, Musar or Musar means, it, it's kind of, um, it is, but what's the technical, how do you technically, Musar really Musar, like to pass over, like to, you're transmitting something, okay? But Musar really means like rebuke. It, it actually means rebuke. Like when you when you give someone musar, you're giving them a little bit of like, you know, a little bit of piece of your mind. So, but we start off by explaining that our generation is so fragile that we actually we're, we're not a generation that could easily accept rebuke. We're just we're so we fall apart. So giving musar needs to be covered top, bottom, and side with love. So when we're talking about changing ourselves, it's the Musar movement is done in a way where you could actually swallow it because otherwise it's, it's so sharp. It's like, it's really harsh, right? And over the last, I mean, this is going on for a thousand years, like the Musar movement started about a thousand years ago, but in the last couple hundred years, there have been whole institutions that are solely focused on Musar, uh, on character development. And, and some of them, very extreme like there there were some extreme like you know like you, you would almost like pain your body to to rise spiritually so it's been very interesting to see the movement and he's like the most modern of like the contemporary giants i would say alan marina so i mean it, this book is amazing it's life-changing he has a couple books um so we'll, we'll probably go through all of them this is just like great stuff so how should we end this um okay so I'll, I'll just end, end it, I'll, I'll tie it all together. Um, so the book, Chovot Halavavot, which is Duties of the Heart, the, the author wrote, the essence of a person of faith is equanimity, okay? But as we just said, there is there is like, there has to be balance within it, right? And um, there has to be realistic goals set to what equanimity really is and means. Um, one, one way that is spoken about in great depth over here is distancing yourself from things that will, that will bring you away from equanimity, okay? So he says here, distancing and we're rising above, distancing yourself from anger, pride, um, you know, things like that, that could take you away from this healthy balance. So it's either distancing yourself from yourself, from the things that bring you anger and pride or distancing yourself from people that have these terrible traits, right? So that's that's one way. I mean, there are many ways of kind of finding that balance, but that's one way Like, um, yeah, that's, that's basically, it's basically what it is. It's, I mean, you know, I'll just, I'll just read one paragraph to end, okay? Do we face struggles? Yes. Are the struggles real? Yes. Do the consequences matter? Yes. Do we still feel the full range of human emotions and drives? Yes. In other words, every aspect of your current life is real and important. You would be wise to embrace it because it's your soul's curriculum. I love that word. Your soul's curriculum. Your soul has a curriculum but cultivate the witness who will make you the master of the inner realm and not the victim. So you are the witness to your own experience. You wanna be the master and not the victim. That's so interesting. We're actually gonna be talking about this tonight. We're having a marriage class tonight, a couples group. And this is some of the things that we're talking about, like the victim in a relationship, victim. And, you know, there's, there's, there's so many things that go on in a relationship. Like, who do you want to be, the master or the, vict uh, or the victim, right? So, um, yeah. So our job as the witness, because we are the witness, right, to our own experience, our job is to keep an eye out for that light, okay? It's speaking about like the light that, that we're attracted to, like the inward light. When you realize that and assign this task to your inner witness and strengthen this practice, then over time, the witness will make you more aware of the radiance that
that is a constant in the ever shifting content context in which you live. An inner eye connected to the constant light won't give you a life of fewer challenges and struggles, but it will give you equanimity that will serve you well as you engage with those challenges. Okay, and I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end here. A person who has mastered peace of mind has gained everything. Okay, so that's it for today. So good to be with all of you. And whoever wants to come tonight, tonight's a, a couples group here at 7.30 till nine. Uh, next we'll do, we'll do a speed dating. 7.30 till nine. Bye guys. Hi Sue. Hi Gloria. Hi Susan. Hi Judy. Oh, hi Sophia. We miss you guys. I wish you were all here in person. There's so many people here today. I, and I'll show you guys. I think there's like 35 people, but it's, I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I miss you all. Feel good if those of you are not feeling good. And we'll see you next Tuesday.